Multiple component distillation is another topic that chemical engineers are chemically introduced to in a uh, mass transfer class. And it involves an incoming stream that has more than two components that we now must separate. And things do get quite a bit more tricky because now we are working with uh, various components and numerous uh, volatilities. And so staying organized and keeping track of all these uh, variables is very important. It also makes the math quite a bit more complicated and being able to model these systems uh, is more difficult. And we turn to uh, equations such as the Fenske equation to help us estimate the number of plates we'll need. But in practice today, it is most common that we'll use computer programs like Aspen to actually model uh, these kinds of distillation columns. But it still is good to understand fundamentally the what's going on in these systems and uh, the math involved behind what these computer simulations are actually doing. And so multi-component distillation is essentially the same setup as a binary distillation. We still have a feed stream coming in. We'll have some stack of column um, stack of trays and we'll have some kind of uh, condenser at the top of our distillation column and a distillate. So this will be a feed, a distillate. Um, this is our condenser and coming out of the or at the bottom of our distillation column we'll have, still have a reboiler and we'll pipe some, we may pipe some uh, moles back up into our distillation column and then we'll also take out a bottoms stream. And the first thing to do when you are given a multi-component distillation problem is make a table to have all your components and list them in terms of the, with the most volatile component at the top and the least volatile component at the bottom. In other words, you will have the component with the highest boiling point at the very top of your uh, table and the lowest boiling point at the bottom. And so to create a generic table, I will have a column for a component, and then I will define another quantity, alpha i h k. And this tells us the relative volatility of component i to component to our heavy key component that I'll get to in a few minutes or seconds. And uh, I'll have another column here just so that we can keep track of uh, what type of component, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit. So in this generic example, I'll be having four components, A, B, C, and D. And I will define component B as what we call a light key and component C as a heavy key. And the reason we uh, need to define heavy keys and light keys is for the mathematical models that we'll apply later on. And when we are deciding what two species to declare as our heavy and light key, it is best to pick two uh, components that have the biggest difference in volatility or boiling points. And the greater the difference between these volatilities of these two components, the better our non-distributing assumption that we'll make later on becomes. And so in this example, because I let component B be our light key and component C be our heavy key, uh, what we'll have, and you'll have numerical values when we were actually evaluating problems like this, but in this example, we would have alpha A H K, and that would have some numerical value. We'd have alpha B H K, and then, um, the relative volatility of the heavy key to the relative volatility of the heavy key will have a value of 1.0. And then finally, we'll have a relative volatility of component D to the heavy key here. And what uh, a further note I would like to make at this point is to recognize where um, or what type of components these are. And so we already defined that component B was our light key and component C was our heavy key. And what that means is that uh, we'll have additional types of 
components, anything above your light key on this table that we've just drawn will be referred to as a lighter than light key component, so LLK, and anything beneath the heavy key on this table will be referred to as the heavier than heavy key component. And the next step that we will make in modeling our system is to say, is to make the non-distributing assumption. And what the non-distributing assumption tells us is that all lighter than light key components from this table that we just drew um, are, will only exit our system in the distillate. And uh, all heavier than heavy key components will only exit in the bottoms stream. And the reason uh, we make the non-distributing assumption is that it allows us to make uh, mass balances. If we do a component mass balance on a heavier than heavy key, we're able to uh, generate some equations that help us define variables or solve for variables later on. And to uh, go over the uh, a key point to take away before we define a uh, light key and a heavy key in our example is we would want in our generic example alpha b hk or alpha lk hk to be a lot greater than one. So um, we want alpha lk hk to be as much greater than one as we can make it because it makes um, the non-distributing assumption a better uh, approximation. And at this point, a good question to ask is how many trays will be required in our multi-component distillation uh, unit? And so we'll have some requirements such as uh, we want a certain concentration of some particular component in our distillate stream. And uh, the way we'll do that is we'll turn to something called the Fensky equation spelled F-E-N, sorry, S-K-E. The Fensky equation tells us that N, the number of trays that will be required, is equal to log base 10 of the quantity of the molar ratio of your light key in your distillate divided by the molar ratio of your heavy key in your distillate times the molar ratio of your heavy key in your bottom stream divided by the molar ratio of the light key in your bottom stream. And we divide this first, or this logarithm by the logarithm of and then this is log base 10, of alpha, so the relative volatility average. And so um, the first thing I'll do is uh, note the terms inside of this uh, top in our numerator. Uh, this is the mole ratio of the heavy component in the bottom stream. And something to uh, understand is that uh, because our heavy key is less volatile there's a it will be more concentrated in the bottom stream than in the distillate and uh, it'll be a lot more concentrated than the light key in the bottom stream and so we would expect both of these quantities inside of our logarithm function to 
be greater than one. And uh, what this alpha average term is, is a geometric mean of the relative volatility between your light key and heavy key evaluated at the top and the bottom of our column. And it's important to note that inside these distillation columns, the bottom tray will have a much higher temperature than, in the, than at the top of the column. And that's because in our reboiler, that's where we're adding in a lot of heat to our system. And at the top of the column, that's where our condenser is removing heat from our system. So it will naturally be a lot colder. And so because of this, the uh, vapor, the volatilities will take on a different values because the volatility will have be some function of temperature that we'll have to evaluate. And so uh, elaborating on what this alpha average term is, it is equivalent to the square root of alpha LK HK evaluated at the top of the column divided by alpha LK or I'm sorry you're multiplying it by alpha the relative volatility of your light key to your heavy key at the bottom of your column and so these are functions of temp temperature and so once we know what these two terms are, we can evaluate alpha average and uh, generally in a problem statement or your supervisor will come to you and they'll tell you that uh, we can't have, we need a certain molar ratio of our light key in a distillate or something like that. Uh, we can now fully define the number of trays that will be needed to a reasonable degree of accuracy. It is important to note though that this Fenske equation is relying on the non-distributing assumption that we've made earlier on, and that's not necessarily 100% accurate. And a way of checking the accuracy of the non-distributing assumption is to turn to the Gilliland equation. I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, but the Gilliland equation uh, tells us the uh, accuracy of the non-distributing assumption. And finally, uh, the last equation that is important to know, and this, so the Gilliland equation, as well as the Underwood equation, uh, are equations that you can find in mass separation textbooks. Uh, so I'll just say why you would need it. So th the Underwood equation is used when you need to find the minimum reflux ratio of your system. And at your minimum reflux ratio, infinitely many stages are required. And this is because we have, we create something on, if we were to analyze this on a macabre Thiele plot, we would generate a pinch point when we operate at a slope of R min because uh, our operating line will um, touch the equilibrium curve, which results in uh, infinitely many trays needed and you'll never really reach equilibrium um, due to thermodynamics. And so this concludes a general introduction into binary distillation. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions and thank you for watching.